Chapter 2, Ray West Our first date was at Greenbrier Mall. Ray West picked me up in his old car. It was pretty beat down. I don't remember the make or model, but I do remember that part of the windshield was covered with duct tape and the passenger side door didn't open. So I had to get in on the driver's side and slide over. But I didn't mind. I really liked Ray. He was ambitious and had his own photography business. That was part of the attraction. I believe a lot of girls look for guys who are like their dads, especially if they look up to and admire their dads as I did mine. My dad always preached self-sufficiency and being self-employed. Well, Ray worked for himself and he was very smart, creative, and focused. He was not typical, not at all. We met at Spelman College where I was working full time. During those days, I worked three jobs. I taught business writing part-time at Atlanta College of Business. I also filled in for the secretary at a law firm each day while she went to lunch. But my main job, in addition to completing a master's degree at Atlanta University, was working at Spelman as assistant to the head of public relations. I was in charge of recruiting for the school's up-and-coming pre-med program. Spelman had a huge waiting list, but the vast majority of students came from outside of the Atlanta area. Some people in town viewed the school as mob, as snobbish and felt that it overlooked talent in its own backyard. I was sent out to change that perspective. I helped to bring into the school some of the best and brightest in all of Atlanta. Ray was an independent contractor hired by the PR director to shoot photographs for the new brochures and other promotional items. Sometimes we went out together on recruiting trips. He'd shoot striking black and white photographs and I'd tell the counselors and sometimes the students all about the program. He was a master photographer. Everyone loved his work, especially Judy Gerbry Hewitt, my supervisor and the head of public relations. She had fallen in love with the photos he'd taken in South Sea Island. He had won awards for some of those shots and to look at them made you feel as though you were right there experiencing the culture. Judy raved about his work. Clearly, she loved it, almost as much as I would come to love Ray West. The first time we actually spoke was over the telephone. Judy had set up the introduction and was excited because she thought Ray and I were hit it off. She had told me about, his, about this photographer and how great she thought he was. After we spoke, I went into her office. Judy, I thought you said Ray was black, I said. He is. No, he isn't, I said. Not the man I just talked to. Ray sounded absolutely white. He didn't just sound like a black man changing his tone and inflection so that the ethnicity would not be readily detected. I could usually tell if that was the case. No, this was the true speaking pattern of Ray West, and he sounded 100% white. As I got to know him, I understood why. He'd been a military kid and had grown up in white neighborhoods. He was born in Tucson, Arizona, but moved from there when he was two. He lived a different experience than most black kids. He even lived overseas for a while. He never even had a black teacher until he went to college. And he never really lived what one might call a black experience. Suddenly, when he enrolled at the mostly white University of Delaware, the tide turned. For someone who didn't act, speak, dance, dress, or do much of anything else Black, how ironic that Ray West was so active, so vocal in the Black student government that he was elected its president. I love to hear him talk about how he snatched the microphone from the president of the university one day at an assembly. I love that he was militant, fiery, passionate, and above all, very, very smart. I had never been out with a man like Ray. I was completely captivated. Despite how different we were, there was an instant connection. Before Ray, I hadn't dated a whole lot. I was very picky about who I decided to spend my time with. When I was in high school, I pretended to be cooler than I was. A lot of girls were giving it up, but not me. I didn't have sex until I was entering my second year of college. 
most of the men I dated were guys who were kind of popular and had smooth pickup lines and a little game. Ray had none of that, and I liked that he didn't. He was a bit of a nerd, and I liked that too. He had very little fashion sense with his J.C. Penny baggy pants, and I didn't like that, but I felt that would be easy enough to fix. He was honest and sincere and didn't play games, which was perfect for me. Yes, our first date was at Greenbrier Mall. We had a nice romantic dinner at Piccadilly Cafeteria. We had both chosen the place. It was quick, clean, and had great food and enough atmosphere for two people who only wanted to look at each other. Afterward, we held hands as we walked about the mall. There was a fountain in the mall where people would make wishes. On that very first real date, we'd been together professionally several times. I threw three pennies in the fountain and wished that Ray West would be my husband. Three months later, we were married. Looking back, I think God wanted Ray to be the father of my child, which was strange since neither one of us had ever wanted children. I watched both of my older sisters get married and have children when they were very young. I watched their lives go in a direction that was not that appealing to me. My older sister finished high school at 16 and went off to college, but returned home after a couple of years and got married. My other sister married a military man as soon as she finished high school. She finished college after all of her kids were grown. I grew up watching them rip and run behind kids and I thought, oh no, that will not be my life. I loved children, but I also wanted so much more for myself. And I believed at the time that children would pre prevent me from having it all. Ray wanted to have it all too. He and I discussed traveling around the country and around the world. We were going to have a very nice home, two very nice cars, eat out all of the time, and have fun. We were going to live the good life. We thought all smart, industrious Black people like us deserved. And that's what we did. There were so many things about us that weren't as compatible as we thought initially. But I didn't process all of that until much later. When we met, there was an instant attraction. We were best friends. Even when we broke up, we remained friends. Not always friendly, but always friends. Even when we didn't see eye to eye, we always had chemistry, lots and lots of chemistry. Friendship and chemistry are great bedfellows and led us quickly to the altar. On January 1st, 1973, Ray and I were married in Oklahoma City. We had a sunrise wedding. Our invitations went out with a picture of Ray and me on the front with our big afros. Behind our silhouette was a sunrise. My mother's sister, Aunt Ruth, made my dress. It was eggshell white, actually cream, and it was beautiful. Some of Aunt Ruth's best work. She was known for being one of the best seamstresses in town. We were married in the church in front of family and friends. We had a small reception in the church basement where we served apple cider and cake. And then we went back to my parents' house for a big country breakfast, fried chicken, grits, rice, and biscuits and gravy. Everything about our wedding was unconventional. We were unconventional. We didn't have a honeymoon. Ray booked us a room at the Ramada Inn on 23rd Street in Oklahoma City. We were supposed to have the honeymoon suite. That's what the man who gave us the room said, but there was nothing sweet about it. The beds were lumpy and the room was not even clean. Worn and tattered bedspreads, yellow sheets that were supposed to be white, dirty floors, dark and dingy walls. I actually cried when I saw the room. So Ray said, let's go. And we were out of there. We packed up a few things we had unpacked and went to my parents' house. And without even considering spending the night there, we grabbed up as many wedding gifts as we to fit in our rented car and headed back to Atlanta that night to start our lives together. We settled into my townhouse. Shortly after starting at Spelman, I had bought my first home. It was a small two bedroom townhouse that I put down $600 on and my mortgage payment was $125 a month. I was living there when I met Ray. He had a gorgeous loft 
apartment in Greenbrier Village. It was huge with the fireplace. His bedroom overlooked the living room, which had no furniture. In fact, the only room he furnished was his bedroom, which was the only room he really cared about, so he didn't have much to move. I hated him giving up that apartment, but there was no point in paying rent when I owned a place. We fixed up my town house and made it a home. I was always creative with decorating. And back then the checkerboard pattern wall I designed using mirrors and 12 by 12 cork board was a real hit. His parents stayed with us once and his mother loved what I had done so much that she went back home and covered one of the walls with cork and mirrors. I was thrilled when I visited their family home in Delaware the first time and saw it. I felt validated. As an artist, Ray was also eclectic and creative. Together, we really were quite adept at turning a house into a home. In fact, that's what we did the entire time we were married. We would drive around suburban Atlanta and dream about where we would live next. If I saw a house I liked, we would buy it. We weren't rich, not on, a, not on teacher's salaries. He taught photography and media production at Clark College and I taught English and speech at Morris Brown College but we somehow managed to do a lot with the money we did have. Not long after being in the townhome, we moved. A deal came along we didn't want to refuse. It was a four bedroom, two story frame house right in the middle of, Cas of the Cascade area. We loved it e enough, even though it needed a little sprucing up. With our skills, we didn't feel that we would, that would be hard at all. It wasn't, we bought, that big greenhouse on Sandtown Road and put a lot into it. We refinished the kitchen cabinets, replaced the kitchen floor, installed new windows and carpet and so on. My mother even came from Oklahoma to help us. Once she had gone, I remember I had this grand idea to paint one of the four bedrooms red. I thought that would be really hip. Ray didn't think so, but he agreed to let me have my way and we went ahead and hired the painter to get started. Fortunately, the painter knew something I didn't and painted just one wall to show me before continuing. When he showed it to me though, I turned into Miss Anne instantly. Oh no, I said, almost shouting. I don't like it, take it off, take it off. I don't care what it costs, just take it off. I was a real drama queen that day, but Ray humored me. He was a trooper. Less than two years later, we were moving again, just eight blocks from Sandtown Road, We'd stumble upon a beautiful house on a quiet tree-lined street. It was brick and definitely better than our home, so, or so we thought. Within a week, we put our house on the market. It sold almost immediately for good profit. We had enough money to buy the brick house on the tree-lined street. The days flew by, no Kanye in sight, not even a thought of him in, in either of our minds. Country drives and long talks, no children, were a part of our weekly routine. We loved it, and it loved us. While driving around an unincorporated part of Atlanta one day, we saw another house and fell in love with it. It was perfect for us. Ray was a nature enthusiast, into natural foods and juicing before it became popular. He was into re eating raw foods and respecting nature. He taught me a lot about that. It sounds funny, but he even taught me to love trees. Anyway, it was a brick home with a huge basement. It sat on four acres, had a creek, and had plenty of room for a garden. Neither of us was into gardening, but still, the room for one sounded good. Actually, the backyard was practically a forest. It was like living in the wilderness. We had a dog, JT, short for Jive Turkey. We'd found him in a shelter already trained, and it seemed such a shame not to bring home the little kitten I'd found abandoned in the parking lot at work. For some reason, why, I don't know, we called the kitten Mr. Smith. But Mr. Smith ran away for a few weeks and came back pregnant. No more Mr. It was just Ray, Donda, JT, and Mrs. Smith. We were the perfect family. After one year of teaching English at Morris Brown College, I got the opportunity to study for my doctorate at Auburn University. Ray 
was always encouraging and didn't ever seem to have a problem with my going away without him to study. Auburn was just a couple of hours away, as I remember, and we'd planned to see each other every weekend. He would stay home and work as a photographer. He loved his work at the time, but later began to feel that it may not have been wise to turn his hobby into a profession. He was good, I mean brilliant, at shooting pictures and at developing them. He even built and equipped a state-of-the-art darkroom in the basement of our home. Always wanting to create images from start to finish, Ray preferred doing his own development work rather than sending out the film to be developed. I learned a lot from him about photography. He lived and breathed it in those days. He always talked about composition and about shooting with available light. I was impressed by his knowledge and his talent and very proud to be married to the best photographer, bar none. Everyone thought his work was superior, not just me. I remember objecting vehemently, though, vehemently, though, when he wanted to buy a camera lens that cost $1,000. We had a big argument about it because that was a lot of money back then. Heck, it's a lot of money today for a camera lens. I thought the money could have been put to better use, but I didn't win that one. I should have known better than to try to come between Ray West and his camera equipment. Soon, he began shooting photo essays of families, Jenny and Jim Trotter, our neighbors on Sandtown Road, who ultimately became Kanye's first godparents, still had the photo essay he shot of their family displayed proudly on the wall the last time I visited them four or five years ago. Ray and I were faithful to each other, and I believe we trusted each other, totally. My family, my faith in him remained even after a little conversation I accidentally heard, heard one day. The phone rang and Ray answered it. While he was still on the phone, I casually said, who is it? I wasn't being nosy neither. Did I think anything was up? I just wondered who might be calling. One of our friends, I thought. Well, when he told me who it was, some man, he said, whose name I don't remember now. For some reason, I didn't believe it. So while he was upstairs talking rather low on the phone, I went downstairs and picked up the extension line. It was not a man at all. It was a woman's voice and I heard her clearly. Instantly, I hung up the phone. I don't know why, but I wasn't even interested in hearing the conversation. Stranger than that, I wasn't even mad or upset. It crossed my mind then that maybe something was up. Why would he tell me the person was a male? After he got off the phone, I calmly confronted him. You said that was John or whatever name he had used. I said, but that was the voice of a woman. Without even hesitating, he confessed. He told me it was some woman named Cynthia. How funny that I remember that name even today. And that was more than 30 years ago. He told me that he couldn't explain why, but he did like her. Nothing had happened between them, he said, and I believed him. Actually, I still do. Maybe I was being foolish or, or just typically naive but he'd never lied to me and I didn't think he was lying then. Ray was visibly disturbed by the whole situation. He had a little conflict going on and I guess he didn't know quite how to feel or what to do. I had no feelings of jealousy or anger as I'm sure I'd have today if I were married or in a committed relationship with someone and that happened. I just calmly told him that if he liked Cynthia, that sounded like a personal problem to me. He would have to work it out. It wasn't on me. I never felt that our relationship was threatened by her. And really, I'm pretty sure it was not. I loved Ray dearly. And I knew he loved me. Maybe that's why I wasn't more affected by the whole situation. I never heard or asked any more about Cynthia. I wasn't even curious. Ray and I spent all of our time off work together. So there was never any moment when I was wondering where he was or what he may have been doing. Maybe it was just a passing thing that happened in a short space of our be being together. I never met Cynthia, nor do I want to. Maybe it was just a one call stand. Some months later, I went off to Auburn to study for my degree and left Ray working in Atlanta. As planned, we'd see each other every weekend and we were always elated to be together. After my first year at Auburn, Ray decided to join me. 
There, he would study in the media department and teach medical illustration at Tuskegee Institute, just 30 minutes away from Auburn. He earned a master's in audiovisual studies and media. Like Kanye would come to be, he was a highly visual person and really adept at any kind of work that involved visual representation. Ray and I had many good times together in Auburn. We lived in married student housing, just two blocks away from the sprawling campus. We enjoyed the friendship of one of my favorite professors, Michael Little Littleford, and made really good friends with Bart McSwine and his wife, Donna. Bart and Donna were the only black professionals we knew in Auburn. All the other black people we saw were laborers, taking toilet paper out of trees whenever the Tigers would win a football game. The Auburn Tigers were good though, so a lot of black people stayed employed. Donna and Bart both taught at Tuskegee but lived in Auburn. Ray had met Bart at a health food store and instantly they became friendly. Soon we visited them and Donna and I hit it off too. They had a baby girl, Maisha. She was beautiful and I was impressed with their vegetarian lifestyle and the way they were raising her. Life was good in Auburn, but it was not without its down moments. Twice while we were there, Ray and I separated. We had begun not to get along very well at all. So funny, however, that every time we'd separate, we'd become best friends again. Once, we even found an, imp uh, an apartment for Ray in Tuskegee, but he never even stayed in it. In the course of buying sheets, towels, dishes, and everything else he'd need, Imagine us doing that together when we, decide, when we decided to split up. We began liking each other again and didn't want to spend a night apart. It was crazy, but I'm glad it happened that way. That was before Kanye was born. So had we stayed apart, there would never have been a Kanye West. I completed all my requirements for my degree, except for the dissertation. Ray had already received his master's and it was time to return to Atlanta. We bid goodbye to our friends and professors and headed back home. The plan was for me to finish my writing from Atlanta. Times were good. To my knowledge, few, if any, in our circle had it better. I guess those were what some would call the good old days. Ray West was my sweetie. And despite our not getting along at times, we were still crazy about each other. We'd weathered the storm, weathered some things I won't even share here. We'd come a long way since that faded day we, we met just three years earlier. Those three coins had paid off a million fold.